you go into organizations and everyone's talking about value. You look at the marketing pieces and the marketing pieces say, look at all the value we're providing you. That's the wrong thing to do. What you have to do is you have to say, look, this is why this product is going to make things better for you. And you darn well better know what the better is. And by focusing on the, those reasons, it increases the likelihood that a customer is going to buy your products. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. costs 15 times the price. <laughs> Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and today our guest is the one and only Reed Holden. Here are three things you want to know about Reed before we start, and oh, it was hard to get it down to three. <laughs> he is truly a luminary in pricing. He's been in pricing since 1987. That is 32 years. I just did the math for you. He co-authored the second and third editions of the book, The Strategy of and Tactics of Pricing. And I used that book when I taught pricing at Ohio State in the late 90s. Um, he's also written a couple other fantastic pricing books, uh, Pricing with Confidence and Negotiating uh, with Backbone. And then number three, in 2002, he founded Holden Advisors, and they are still going amazingly strong. Welcome, Reed. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. Yeah. And, and the thing I didn't put in that I really wanted to is you may remember you interviewed me for a job in probably 2000, 1999, something like that. Yeah. That was a long time ago. Oh, my gosh. So. Well, we've got a lot of water under the bridge, but, you know, in the words of Robert Frost, we have miles to go before we sleep. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, how did you get into pricing? How did that? It's got to be a great story. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a great story. I gone back to Boston University for my terminal degree, and there was a junior faculty member there who had just started having taught at University of Chicago, and his name was Tom Nagel. Mm. And I, I ended up taking his class and he evaluated me because my specialty at the time was uh, business to business marketing. And he needed someone that summer to write the teacher's manual for his first book on the first edition of Strategy and Tactics of Pricing. And I worked with him that summer. And as you know, he eventually left BU and started Strategic Pricing Group. And I went with him on a part time basis until I got my degree. And you know, eventually uh, went and we went and did the whole thing full time. Nice. And so although you never really went into marketing, pricing is really just business. It includes marketing and product and, and setting that price and selling. Yeah. And, you know, the way we think about it is pricing really touches everything, I mean, even down to the production floor. I mean, we see cases where bad pricing causes massive problems. In the factory, if you're a services organization, you have people sitting idle. So it, it you know, and certainly it touches the two most important elements of a business, and that is its revenue and profitability. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the topic that we're going to discuss today, and hopefully we get really deep and understand this this well, is value. And let's start yeah. off. What's your definition of value? I'll share mine with you after you share yours. Well, I mean, there are, there are multiple definitions of value. There's an emotional value. A lot of the consumer research uses emotional and or attitudinal value. For the sake of, a, I, we do most of our work in a business-to-business -business environment. And for the sake of a business-to-business -business environment, we use as a definition what is known as value and use. That is, as a result of using my products and services, how do organizations benefit financially. Yeah, I like that a lot, but I'm going to push back. First off, let me share mine. Uh, my definition yep, is sim yep. simply what is a buyer willing to pay? And I would certainly agree with the emotional piece. There's emotions involved in that. I think value yep. and use has a big role to play. I use the word value and use usually to mean if I don't have competition, we're just talking about the inherent value of my product. And so my willingness to pay is some percentage of what you're going to get out of that inherent value of the product. 
But if I have competition, it's that Eve analysis that we all read out of Nagel's book, right? Yep, yep, yep. And, yep. and so how, how do you reconcile or do you still use value in use when you're talking about that Eve analysis? Well, EV, um, EVE, it st- actually started out as EVA, economic value analysis, and we moved it to EVE in the second edition of strategy and tactics of pricing because there was a financial term, economic value added. EVE stands for economic value estimation. And I, I like value in use because it shows, it focuses on financial value. That is, you know, how does it reduce an organization's costs? How does it help them sell more products? How does it help them charge more for their products? And it's basically putting a, you know, a spreadsheet together, which, you know, I'm sure we'll end up talking about, but it's having, having an understanding of how your customers operate and wh- what you does improves, impacts their operation. And, you know, my criteria has always been the ability of putting a dollar sign and all that. Yeah, I think in the world of B2B, we have this amazing advantage that says, if you can't put a dollar value on a feature or on a product, as in how much money your customer is going to make or save because they bought your product, no one's going to buy your product. So, But uh, but the, the amazing thing, Mark, is how many companies actually try to do just that, that is sell a product without having an understanding of the financial benefit of the customers. Can I say close to zero? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to think it's getting better, but it certainly is significantly less than it should be. Yeah, it, it, is, it is incredible to me. Now, we see companies with ROI calculators. Would you call that hemp to yep. value? Yeah, I mean, ROI calculators are, you know, are good. And in a number of books that we've written that contain allusions and specifics around ROI calculators, they're great. But it's interesting because, as you know, probably um, seven or eight years ago, we published the Negotiating with Backbone book. And that, that put us very active with salespeople. And as we get into sales teams, in organizations that had deployed ROI calculators, one of the biggest problems that, that organizations have is the salespeople don't use them. And if the salespeople don't use them, then certainly customers don't see them. And it's led us to really move in a direction to try to simplify the calculations as much as possible. Because, you know, we've seen who were in a, a medical device situation one time where, you know, the client had spent literally millions of dollars to determine what the value was, you know, down to the number of Q-tips used in the procedure. And they, they, they totally missed the big value drivers. And so I, I think that what we try to do is we try to say, hey, what are the really big value drives that everyone can look at and understand? And, and how can you make a calculation on, you know, the back of an envelope or a napkin so that everyone can look at it, understand it, and believe in it? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's absolutely spot on. If we understand why people buy our products, so we go out and we talk to some people who've already bought our product. Why did they buy yep. it? They didn't buy it because of the number of Q-tips we saved. Right. right. <laughs> there was some big picture understanding. And when we understand that, now we can help other people understand that. So exactly. And, and, you know, the big thing in, in the linkage is being able to convince salespeople. I mean, how many sales meetings have you been to where a product manager will stand up and present the new product with absolutely no calculations of value? And, you know, the sales guys roll their eyes. If the sales guys roll their eyes, what's the point? We're going to go so deep into a horrible topic here, right? Because product yeah. people love their product features and yep. nobody, nobody buys a product feature. People only right. buy the value of the product. And, and so they teach their salespeople about the product and the product features. And yep. so we're going to talk yep. about the product and the product features. And no wonder we never capture value. It's this, it, it drives me nuts. <laughs> But the, the interesting thing is, you know, the, my, my guys came to me and, you know, asked me to do a piece on value. And the title of the article was something along the lines of, are you sick of hearing about value? You go into organizations and everyone's talking about value. You look at the marketing pieces and the marketing pieces say, look at all the value we're providing you. That's the wrong thing to do. 
What you have to do is you have to say, look, this is why this product is going to make things better for you. And you darn well better know what the better is. And by focusing on the, those reasons, it increases the likelihood that a customer is going to buy your products. And I, it's amazing to me. Yeah, I think the issue that we struggle with is we use the word value and we know what that means. It means um, how, do, how do I get someone to put a dollar on this because we're going to make money or save money for them. And yet yep. people inside the companies, they use the word value and they just kind of toss it out there without really grasping what it means. Would you buy that? We call that I, absolutely. And in, in fact, I often talk about, about moving beyond the rhetoric of value. Oh, yes. That's awesome. One of the things, okay, you brought up the the negotiating with backbone book, and I got to say to the listeners, fantastic book. If you haven't read Thank that you. and you work with salespeople, go get the book, read it. It opens your eyes. You have these these suspicions of this is how the world works, and all of a sudden, what Reed did in that book is make it. They get, he gave you a framework and said, "Oh gosh, yes, that's exactly right." It was, yeah. it was fantastic. Now the reason Thanks, I did. Mark. Oh, you're very welcome. The reason I did all that was because let's say that we can get our salespeople to sell value. They sell value to the buying committee, but the buying committee chose it and goes to procurement. Do you have a value conversation you have with procurement or, or do we just go back to that book negotiating with backbone? Well, I mean, I'm not saying that procurement people don't like to talk about value. In fact, I will say that they do love to talk about value, but believe it or not, in recent times, the first book on value was written by a procurement person. And when he was talking about value, he was talking about cost reductions. So when procurement people talk about value, they're thinking reduce price. When we talk about value, we think increase benefits. And it's a disconnect that's never reconciled. And one of the things we, we, we talked about in the Backbone book was, gee, if you're going to send a salesperson in to talk about value with a procurement person, you have to recognize that they're trained to sweep that discussion off the table and say, listen, all products are the same. It's what we call playing poker. And a big piece of what we try to do with salespeople is to get them to recognize that conversations with procurement people is like playing a game of poker. And the way they win the game is by bluffing. And unless you're prepared to play the game back, you're going to lose each and every time. That just makes so much sense. Yeah. How's the podcast going? Are you getting value? Research shows that people don't really value what they get for free. But I'm hoping you'll prove this research wrong. Please demonstrate to us and the entire world that you value this podcast. Would you please pause the podcast, subscribe if you haven't already done so, rate the podcast, and leave us a short review. You'd be doing a huge favor. And research shows if you invest this little bit of time, you'll probably like the podcast even more. Win-win. Pause. Do it now. We'll wait for you. We don't need to talk about procurement people anymore today. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Let's talk about value. That's more fun. Yeah, it is way more fun. Okay. So, so when you go in and coach a company about value, what are you guys doing now? How do you help them do that? Well, I mean, we, we try to get them to the basics of what their products and services do. And those two words are very important. There's a tendency for a lot of the value work to focus on products. What we often find is the thing that distinguishes companies is their ability to service those products. In the Pricing with Confidence book, we talked about the dirt company. And they recognize that, you know, everyone sold the same type of dirt but it was their ability to service the customers more quickly that reduced the customer's cost and gave them a competitive advantage in their marketplace. You know, so what we try to do is get them to understand the why of how customers buy the products and the reason that they might be inclined to buy your particular products. And, you know, it's amazing the number of people to whom that is a foreign conversation, even senior executives. 
Yeah, I, I think we get so enraptured into our own products that we stop we stop looking outside the products and say, what problems are we solving? And and are there other problems we could solve with our distribution channel, with our with the way we support and service our products? Uh, there's tons yep. of them yep. to create out there. Yep. I did an interesting thing uh, about a month ago. The Dirt Company, you know, that was in the Pricing with Confidence book that's now probably 11, 12 years old. And I had a chance to see the guy who brought us in there. And he was talking about how a new CEO had taken over that didn't believe in value. And I clicked on the financial report of the company. And while they were focusing on value, they were growing in both revenue and profitability during the, yeah, even during the hard times. And as soon as the new CEO took over, their financial performance had been flat for the past four years. Hmm. Every, all of our listeners right now, readers, saying, what's the story? What's the story? Could you tell the story? <laughs> oh, sure. So this is a bit of a disguised company. But what happened is the, the pricing director's name was Dave. And this was a 50 division, a regional division company that sold uh, Durant. And it, you know, if, if you think about it, in any region, there were probably eight to 10 competitors that were selling the same Durant and it came out of a quarry. And, and, and by the um, way, I want to say the following words. Would it be fair to say yep. that Durant is a commodity? It would be fair to say that Durant is a commodity. Yes, but okay. what, what David, yeah, what David did is David went out and had a conversation with a customer. So David asked a couple of questions. He said, you know, what do you really need from us? And he goes, well, geez, you know, we spend a lot of time yeah, waiting for you guys to fill up the trucks. Well, why is that important? And as well, because it's costing me 90 to 100 bucks an hour to get through your facility. Well, how would it be valuable if we cut it in half? So sure, it would save me, you know, 45 bucks an hour, 45 bucks an hour and a 16 ton truck works out to uh, about, you know, 253 bucks a ton. And what they did is they implemented a, what I'll call a flanking gate strategy. And when you went into the quarries, there were two gates. At gate B, there was a line of trucks. At gate A, there was no line of trucks. And there was a D5 dozer sitting there ready to load up the trucks. And so a sales guy would go in and have a conversation with, you know, a cement contractor or an asphalt contractor who were the primary customers. And think about it. Cement and asphalt contractors all have to bid in order to win their business. So it's a very price-oriented business. And the sales guy, you know, would go in and you know, the contractor would say, how much, how much is your dirt today? And the, the sales guy would say, it's going to cost you 11 bucks a ton. And the guy would come in and say, well, you have a competitor in here at, at 1050. The sales guy would say, oh, oh, we can meet 1050. In fact, we can meet 1025, but you have to go through gate B in the quarry. And the contract says, what's gate B? It says, not services fast. And the contractor would quickly calculate that they would save money by paying a little bit more for the dirt. And, you know, it's, we use it as, I mean, we've extended it to professional services. In fact, we've done a lot of global work and extremely high value professional services in both consulting and finance and the legal business. But, you know, the, the commodity story tells it all because if, if it works in commodity, I guarantee you it works in the high value stuff. But you had a simple conversation. Yeah. And that story is so powerful because we think we're selling dirt. But in yep. truth, we're not selling dirt. We're selling a solution to a problem, which includes using the truck as efficiently as possible as we're delivering dirt to our customers. So I, I, yep. that is such an amazing story. I've, I've, yeah. I've repeated your story, although I always give you credit. I've repeated your story <laughs> many, many times because it is so powerful. Yeah. And, and I often ask people, hey, go look at gold prices, right? Go to Atmex, go to Blanchard's they have different prices for gold. Isn't gold a commodity? Yep. Yep. Why do they get to charge different prices? So yep. it's, it's always about other things, not just the product itself. And, and sometimes you have, have to work hard to discover those products. You know, we, we went into a situation one time with the client had, when I say they had several feet of research, I mean, thickness of research. And mm -hmm. I remember just being absolutely overwhelmed. 
And this thing about talking to customers, the official name for it is ethnographic research, also known as depth research. Mm -hmm. And one of our people was talking to a guy in, you know, some really far out place. And he mentioned something that was a massive driver of value that the client hadn't even picked up on. And, you know, it's all the research in the world. Nothing is better than going out and having discussions with customers that begins to point uh, pinpoint what their real needs are. Yeah. I had the privilege of teaching for Pragmatic Marketing, now Pragmatic Institute, for the last six years. And their mm-hmm. basic concept, the single most underlying thing they do, and they focus more on product management and developing new products, but the yeah. single thing they talk about all the time is go out and listen to the market. Right? You yeah. have it. And, and I don't get how you do any of these jobs if we're not listening to the market. But you would be amazed at the number of companies that, you know, they, they develop products and services internally. You know, an engineer comes out of a lab, says Eureka, and they expect this thing to sell, but they don't know what the application is. Yeah, trust me, Reed, I wouldn't be surprised. I've seen so many of those now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Would you say that this, this research that we're doing that says, hey, I've got this product and now I want to know what other services support that I could put around it that maybe I could capture value from that. Would you say that's more important if I've got heavy price competition for the product, kind of like the dirt commodity? I think I would agree with that, Mark. I have agreed with it maybe 10 years ago, but we did a, a lot of work in high value consulting for you know, one of the big global guys, and they had as many problems as the dirt company did in this area. And that's extremely high value professional services. So the point is that what we've learned is that procurement has invested massively in learning how to drive down prices in all high value areas. You know, you look at what's happening in computers, computer services, IT services. It's all been commoditized. And it's not because it is a commodity. It's because procurement people has, have driven it to a commodity and the organizations that are selling those commodities don't know how to get out of that trap. And the way you get out of that trap is the first rule is to understand why you're different than the competitors. And you see three very different titans trying to compete with each other on price when in fact they're very different companies. And I remember going into one of those companies say, hey, if you can't figure out how to do this, no one can. And, and, you know, that big company has struggled to grow profits and revenue for the past, you know, five, six years. And and do you think their problem was, we're going to go back to the topic. Do you think it was because they didn't understand value? They didn't understand the way buyers perceive value. And so how they had to package and talk about their own capabilities and, and offerings? No, I think this is going to seem like I'm into an area that you don't want to, but this is why we wrote the Backbone book, because what we discovered is that the procurement tactics that had been used in the automobile industry in the 1970s and moved into manufacturing in the 1980s and moved into professional service in the 1990s had hit every supplier of everything. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the United States, whether you're in Russia, whether you're in China. We've been to all the places, and it's companies Companies don't understand the value, don't understand the games procurement plays, and therefore they think the only thing they can compete with is price. And the interesting thing to me is a, a reaction I often get is, oh, wait, you don't understand our business. And <laughs> my reaction to those guys is, no, you don't understand your business. Yeah, because I used I used to be in procurement. I'm a member of the organization, and I took the advanced training in preparation for the book. So, the, you know, the the thing about value is if you don't understand it, you're toast. And even if you understand it, you still have to learn how to play poker in order to get fair profits for your company. Yeah, I think that's the, I think that's the absolute truth, and the whole playing poker with procurement piece. So many companies don't do that well, but if you don't have value, you don't have a game to play anyway. You can't go in at procurement because there's nothing different. Yeah, but everybody, what we've discovered is everyone has value because every company is selling something. 
And if they're selling it, companies are buying it. And there's a reason companies are buying it. Let me say that differently. I agree. If you can't articulate your value and convince the buying committee of what your value is, then there's no chance of winning. Yep. Yeah, I I agree with that. I agree with that. Oh my gosh, this is just this is just fascinating. Let me let me talk about what we what we started this off with. You used the words value in use. Define Mm -hmm. that word. Define that phrase for me. What do you mean? If a company is going to use your product or service, studying that use should provide you with an understanding of how it creates value. It started out as an engineering term for us in pricing. It's a, you know, understand the financial benefit of a company using your product and service. Yep. Okay. And let's drive back to the dirt example. What's the value and use of dirt? There's no value in use. That's why I always say products and services. Right. Okay. I'm with you. And so in truth, yep, this, what we're really saying is what's the value in use of the differentiators, whether that's services, products, things like that. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. And so that is very consistent with the way I think. It's important to me that I think the same way you do, Reed. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say that's not, that's not a, a, a worthy objective, Mark. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I use the words value and use typically when there is no competition. And what I'm trying to sell to a company is, here's how much value you get out of buying my product. And then I use the words value and choice to say, here's how much value you get out of using my product relative to my competitor's products or relative to the other alternatives. And that's why when I read those words, it just kind of got me. Yeah, we, we automatically include competitive offerings as part of that analysis. Yeah. Okay. And, and by the way, the reason I don't is because oftentimes there's no competitor. And if we could either create products or find situations where we don't have competition, the, the game is very different. The analysis. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Reed, I have so enjoyed talking to you. Can we do this again sometime? I would love to do it again, Mark. I, I got it in. I got it on recording. Uh, so, what's I always end with this one question though? What's the one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think might have a big impact on their business? Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Nice, and the advice is simple, and and it's powerful too. Reed, thank you yep. so much for your time today. If anyone wants to contact you, how can they do that? Yeah, first of all, you're welcome. And my email address is rholden at holdenadvisors.com. And I'd love to hear from people. Okay, great. Great. All right. Episode 23 is in the can. My favorite part of today's podcast was when I agreed with Reed at the end. How could I not? Uh, What was your favorite part? Uh, Let us know in the comments of wherever you downloaded and listened. And while you're at it, would you mind giving us a five-star review? We'd love that. Also, we recently put a subscription growth calculator on our website, impactpricing.com. It's a free Excel file to help you figure out how to grow your subscription business. It's under the resources section tab. Also, if you'd like to share a comment, suggestion, or question with me, feel free to reach out to me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.